I'm good? All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump in here, I think. So. So, hi. I'm Chris. Uh, yeah, Chris Nelson. I work here at Gaslight. So I'm going to be talking today about uh, the PEEP stack. Uh, the PEEP stack is a t term uh, coined um, by, uh, I was just looking at the article and I've already forgotten the guy's name, uh, Justin McAnally, uh, in a blog post. And what PEEP stands for uh, is a, a stack of technologies that can work together um, and you can add a bunch of E's, but the main E's are uh, Phoenix, uh, Ember, Elixir, and then you can kind of add Ecto and Erlang to that mix, um, but Postgres is kind of the, the, the back end of the acronym. And um, it's not so much a framework as in um, all these things are, you know, tightly, you know, integrated or coupled to one another. Uh, but we've been building apps with it, and the technology has kind of fit together really well. Um, so I'm going to spend uh, a few slides kind of talking about them briefly, but the majority of this talk is I'm going to be uh, looking at a code example. And conveniently enough, uh, my example app is, in fact, lunch-related. So uh, we're, we're going to spend a bunch of time digging into code, and please ask questions along the way. Uh, I'm minimal slides and more about code, so um, definitely, you know, the more interactive, the better. Um, so yes, absolutely. Pape, pape. I don't even. It doesn't make any sense. No, there, there are actually some reasons Ember actually fits pretty well with Phoenix, and uh, we'll look at that. But um, as as Angular comes along, especially with Angular two. I'm looking at uh, tying that in as well, but um, we do a lot of our front-end apps with Ember, and, and there's some good things about it that, that make it pretty easy to work with in this, in this particular context. Um, but I'm going to start with talking about Elixir, because of these things, Elixir might be the one that's kind of newer or hasn't gotten as much of a attention so far. Um, and I really feel like it, it, it definitely should, and it will. Uh, Elixir's a functional language. Um, and it's actually on the Erlang runtime. So how many people have heard of Erlang? And how many people have uh, heard of Elixir? So most people have at least heard of it. So that, that's kind of a good thing. Um, but Erlang's been around for a really long time, and I have a slide on Erlang as well. But uh, the thing that I really dig about Elixir, it's a functional language. Um, but it has a more natural language syntax, and this is like completely subjective. And uh, you know, um, but if you're coming from languages like Ruby, for example, uh, the syntax feels a little bit more familiar and is a little bit easier to grok. Um, and you know, for me at least, that that was an easier way to get started and kind of pulled me in more naturally and uh, really piqued my interest. And uh, really just, I found that once I, I dove in, I just kept having fun and, and kept going. And that's, you know, I, I don't have a huge, you know, selling point other than it was a lot of fun for me and, and I've, I've been enjoying myself with it. Um, but the thing that makes Elixir really, really powerful is the Erlang runtime under the covers. Uh, Erlang is a, is a language and really a platform uh, created a, originally by Ericsson. Uh, it goes as far back as the late 80s, but really wasn't really prominently used probably until the 90s or so. Um, but it's designed by Ericsson to run on telco equipment. So what that means is it's really designed for an environment with extremely high concurrency and availability. So it's got to run, you know, all the time, nine nines of uptime, it can't go down. Uh, and, and that's kind of what it's designed for out of the box. So um, interestingly enough, as web apps have become um, larger and larger in terms of throughput, availability, requirements, concurrent users wanting to collaborate, um, 
the characteristics of our web apps that we're building these days have moved more and more in these directions. So um, it's become really, really interesting to look at this language that was originally developed for telco equipment and apply it in the area of building web apps. And there's some interesting kind of benefits you get from that. Um, but Erlang, the language, um, its syntax is highly um, derived from Prolog. So I've never done Prolog before. Um, so my first, um, I, I took a look at Erlang like several times before I do dove into Elixir. Um, and you know, had a lot of smart people telling me, hey, you know, you should look into Erlang, you should look into Erlang. And, and each time I did, um, the syntax was like just enough uh, of, an, of a barrier to me that even though I felt like I should dig in more, I, I just never quite got around to it, to be honest. Uh, whereas like the Elixir syntax, even though it's, it seems like, oh, you know, it's just syntax. Well, it turns out like that was enough to like kind of get me over the hump and pull me in. And then once I did, when I went to go back and look at Erlang code after I'd been doing Elixir for a while, it's like, oh, this makes sense now. So uh, a lot of people kind of see Elixir as kind of the, um, I don't know, I, I lost my analogy here, but an easy way to dip into the Erlang world and you know, you can kind of like come for the Elixir and stay for the Erlang. And that seems to happen to a lot of people. And Nothing wrong with that, you know, it's, yeah, it's a, uh, whatever, yeah, a, dang, I, gateway language, thank you, that was the metaphor I was looking for, and it, like, completely exited my brain, so that's exactly what I was looking for, thank you. Um, so, Erlang is a language, but it's also got a really powerful uh, platform underneath it, and that platform is called OTP, which stands for Online Telephony Platform. I hope I can get all those words right. But um, it's an open source platform that's uh, basically uh, Ericsson abstracted out of the work that we're doing in the uh, work they were doing in the telco space. Uh, and really, OTP at its core is all about processes and message passing. Um, so splitting an app into multiple processes that communicate strictly by message passing. There's no like shared mutable state or anything like that. They're just sending messages back and forth. Uh, but managing an application uh, with that kind of architecture, there's a number of problems that you kind of need to solve to be able to do that. Uh, one of which is release management. Okay, if you have an application of bunches of processes, how do you actually manage the release of your application across those processes, across those services, servers, excuse me, so those processes are not necessarily all on the same machine. They might be on multiple machines. Uh, managing the releases of that is, is certainly becomes challenging. Uh, you also have issues of versioning those apps, uh, hot deploys. So how do you actually manage the deployment where you want to roll it across multiple machines and make sure that you know, everything goes smoothly with zero downtime? That's a pretty challenging problem to solve if you don't have a platform and infrastructure to help you. And OTP has solutions for these problems that have been running since the 90s. So they're pretty mature. Um, and you know, digging into the core of OTP, they're very, very mature, but not always the most approachable things in the world. Uh, but the, with Elixir coming along, they've taken a new look at some of these technologies that have been rock solid for so many years and given you more, uh, more approachable ways to, to leverage them. So uh, that's been pretty cool. Yeah, that's interesting. Did you have a thought there, James? Yeah, actually, I was reading, yeah, that, I'm glad you said that. that I was reading some, some history of Erlang to, to prep for this. And what I read was, like, at some point, 
uh, they actually said, no, we're not going to use Erlang anymore because it's a proprietary in-house language and we want to adopt only like general purpose languages so that we can be able to hire developers and for all the reasons that you generally want to do that. And uh, all the Erlang developers like quit <laughs> and open sourced Erlang and then eventually came back. So it's kind of an interesting story of how it uh, became an open platform. But it was very much a reaction to you know, market forces and you know, the fact that having open languages leads to more developers and better systems and all the reasons that most of us are you know, not programming on some proprietary language as, as much as we can avoid doing so. Um, so anyway, um, OTP. Um, has really good solutions to a lot of problems that you have um, with, uh, and I think I probably have a slide on this in a little bit, but, um, oh yeah, some more stuff to talk about OTP. Um, so it's got really support, good support for breaking a system into multiple applications. Uh, it's also got su good support for supervising and restarting these processes. That's really good support for distributing processes that I kind of already mentioned. And if you put all this together, uh, it might sound really familiar. Uh, there's been a huge push these days to take what, you know, you, you build an application, a web app, it has a really long lifespan, hopefully. It's wildly successfully, hopefully. And if you have that problem, that wonderful problem that you want to have, uh, what you end up with is a big application and a big code base and a big team working on it. And so when you get to that level, there are certain problems that you have. And one of the uh, in vogue solutions to that problem is this idea of microservices. So let's take this big monolithic app and break it up into lots of little tiny services. So that sounds great. You know, then, you know, your team can just work on your service and your team can just work on your service. and and that'll be great. You won't have you know, everybody stepping on each other's toes all the time. But all of a sudden, you have another huge class of problems. And these problems are like, how do I manage that application that now has all these multiple uh, services? How do I manage distributing those services? How do I manage like supervising and restarting those services when they go down? Worse yet, how do I manage uh, the versioning of my app now that I have umpteen different services and how do I you know, do hot deploys and release management. So it turns out like all these problems that we have with microservices, um, OTP is one of the first platforms that I've seen that has uh, out of the box solutions to a lot of these problems. And that's one of the things that I found really compelling about this, this stack. You know, is that it allows me a way to do like practical, uh, lower ceremony microservices. Uh, but that's another talk. Um, so, Elixir, am I going the right way? I have like two slides on Elixir. I kind of didn't mean to do that. Um, but that's okay. Um, so, a couple other things that I really dig about Elixir. I've already kind of mentioned the syntax, and we'll see that here in code in, in just a couple of minutes. Um, but it's got a really rapidly growing ecosystem, which is kind of awesome. So when I first started coming to it, I was like, well, will I be able to find you know, good libraries for the kind of problems that I run into when building a general web app? And what I found uh, is, is generally there's a hex package. Hex is the package management system in the Elixir space uh, to do what I want most of the time. Um, and Elixir really has some nice abstractions over that core Erlang uh, goodness. Um, and one of the interesting things about Elixir is processes feel more like a core abstraction to the language. So um, from a, I'm coming more to Elixir from an object-oriented background. And the interesting thing to me about processes is it's, it gives me a way to model um, state that actually exists in my system, but with a lot fewer of the shared mutable state object-oriented challenges that, that I'm typically used to dealing with. So processes in Erlang and Elixir are about pure message passing. So there's no way for them to reach into each other's state and monkey with things directly. All they can do is pass messages back and forth. And um, they provide like 
complete encapsulation because there's no way for them to get to each other's state. Um, so in a lot of ways, processes feel, and, and a lot of people have made this argument, processes feel uh, a lot more like the original vision of object-oriented programming expressed by people like Alan Kay. So um, let's talk a little bit about Phoenix. Phoenix is definitely um, a key piece that um, kept me, I guess, you know, from, uh, well, it pulled me from like just sort of looking at Elixir and toying with it to actually like building stuff and keeping going. Uh, because it was like just such an easy thing for me to step into. Uh, there's a theme here, you know. I'm all about like things that are easy to, to keep going with and um, anyway. Uh, so Phoenix is the web framework for Elixir. Um, and if you're coming from a background with a, with a um, framework like Rails or any of the other frameworks that look like Rails, you're going to find it super easy to jump, jump into. Uh, you know, the elements that you're used to finding are there and, and things are familiar. Um, but it has some nice stuff um, on top of it that other frameworks haven't had until really recently. Uh, it's got out of the box good support for WebSockets via something called Channels. Uh, so Channels is something that's in Phoenix at the back end to support WebSockets. And Phoenix also actually ships with a JavaScript language, or a, I'm sorry, a JavaScript library uh, for the client side of WebSockets. And we'll see what that looks like here in a minute. So, that's kind of the, um, the Elixir in uh, Phoenix and Erlang end of the stack. Now let's add another E. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about Ember because I feel like Ember's gotten like lots and lots of press. You've probably already, well, have people seen Ember already? How many people have actually like played with and, and written a little Ember code? Okay, so actually probably only about half. So that's cool. I'll definitely spend some time uh, looking at the Ember side of the code base as well and showing you what's there as well. But in a nutshell, Ember is a uh, JavaScript MVC framework and their kind of um, tagline and their sweet spot is it's for building ambitious web apps. So uh, web apps that are a single page from the beginning, uh, and you know, it's not really a great fit for like gradually introducing into an existing app. It's really best for like uh, rich client web apps that are rich client right from the beginning. Um, and the the thing, you know, as well as being a a good um, JavaScript client side MVC framework, it also comes with a data package for talking to backend RESTful data sources out of the box. Um, and it's got Ember Data's um, a really interesting beast. Um, it's technically, you know, it, it, I, I'm not clear at this point whether it's like considered part of Ember Core or not, but generally if you're building an Ember app, you're most of the time going to use Ember Data, but you don't have to. I would say it that way. Um, but it's got good support for talking to the back end. It's also got an identity cache as well. So that becomes really, really important. If you're talking to a back end and you're sending data that represents customer one back and forth over the wire, you really, really, really only want one object in your system that represents customer with ID one. And if you're not careful and you're building an app without something like Ember Data, it's really easy to accidentally have multiple objects. Because if you're just sending JSON back and forth, it's really easy to end up with like umpteen different JSON objects that all say their customer ID one and might have different values. And that's kind of a nightmare. Um, so Ember Data takes care of that problem pretty well because anything that it gets down, it'll go, hey, do I already have customer ID one? Okay, I do. Well, I'll just like merge those parameters or merge that, uh, that state over top, basically. Um, so that's pretty, pretty handy. And we'll see how it's going to help us when we look at this app in just a minute. Um, so Postgres, I don't really have much to say about that. I think it's almost like they put Postgres in there so they have an extra P. Um, but I will say, uh, I think it's the best relational database out there. And um, actually, it, it is worth pointing out, but we'll, there, there's some similarities to this stack and Meteor, which we'll look at this afternoon. 
Uh, and being able to choose Postgres is pretty, pretty nice in terms of having a general relational database backend. So um, just to talk about uh, success indicators in this space, you know, who's actually using this in production and having success with it right now. Uh, the classic huge example for Erlang in particular, and you, know, you can sort of look at it by extension, Elixir, uh, WhatsApp. Uh, WhatsApp, I forget how many engineers they have, but it's like less than 50, I'm pretty sure. And they're like s serving billions of people on that platform, and they're, that's what they're running under the covers is er Erlang. Uh, now, WhatsApp being a chat app, it makes just a ton of sense for them. It's like almost the obvious problem. Uh, you know, chat app, telco, you know, it's very, very similar in a lot of ways. So. Uh, Erlang's been great for them and allowed them to scale with a really small engineering team. Um, on the Elixir and this stack in particular, Elixir and Phoenix, uh, Bleacher Report, which is a huge uh, sports site in terms of traffic. I think they said they were like just behind uh, ESPN in terms of the largest sports traffic site on the web. Uh, Bleacher Report's running Phoenix and Elixir in production. Uh, and the benchmarks of Phoenix have been really uh, kind of mind-bending in, in terms of uh, their scalability, well, at least for me. Um, so um, the creator of Phoenix, Chris McCord, who's, who's up in Dayton, um, he, he is doing some load, marking, load, uh, some load testing of Phoenix recently. And uh, he managed to get two million connected clients on a single server, so that's a pretty large number. And really, he kept running out of machines to hit it with before he could overwhelm the server. And that's you know, kind of the common case. Uh, Erlang's just really, really good at lots and lots of uh, traffic in particular. Uh, it's not optimized for like huge number crunching necessarily, although it can do that. What it's really, really best suited for is if you have a lot of traffic that you need to handle um, that's what it's awesome at. So that's the end of my slides. And what I'm going to do now uh, until lunch shows up and we're hungry is I'm going to demo a lunch-related web app. So let me get to my browser, and I'll show you what I have going on. Uh, as you can see here, <coughs> I am not a designer. And hence my terrible uh, Times New Roman on a white background uh, design. Um, how many people remember when web browsers used to have gray backgrounds? Just curious. Awesome. I was just thinking about the other day. It was like Netscape 2 or 3. Yeah. Yes. So this is Lunch Detective. So Lunch Detective is an app that's all about lunch, and it is designed to solve a specific problem of where does my team want to go to lunch? And so what it does, as we'll see, I'm going to go ahead and log in. Uh, which? The font? What? Command plus the browser. It's about as big as... And the screen after that, this might be too big for. But um, it's got Google authentication built in so they don't have to have everybody type in their email, and that's annoying. Um, so I can just log in with my Gaslight account. And once I log in, I can see a list of lunches. So if I go look at the Cincy Web Tech Lunch, it will see that I have one suggestion so far, and it shows that I'm logged in with my email, and I can vote yes and say, yeah, I want to go ahead and go here. There's nothing to prevent me from multiple voting at this point. So I can vote again, and the way it works is if I say nope, it will send me another suggestion. So. Basically, that's what this app is about. And you, if you have your computer open, you can actually go here and hit lunch detective, lunch-detective.herokuapp.com. 
And you should be able to like log in and vote yes. And if somebody comes on here and votes no, it should actually advance and choose a new restaurant for us to look at. So eventually the plan is uh, there'll be a time period, everybody can vote and if they you know, hit nope, it'll advance and uh, eventually it'll converge on a single place that everybody agrees on. So that's the goal of, of Lunch Detective. Uh, oh, I should point out it's hitting uh, Yelp as the back end each time to actually get the next thing in the list. So that's the app itself. Eventually it will run out of suggestions, so just saying. <laughs> but that's all right. So did you curate the list of potential places or does it just open random again? So what I did, when, when you set up a lunch, and I haven't showed you that screen here. Wow, that's like kind of awesome. Um, you set up a lunch, you give it a title, and you give it a search term. And basically it just hits Yelp and it keeps track of an index in the Yelp results and it'll just keep advancing. And now I'm out of lunch, so. <laughs> so, I can make a new lunch though. Lunch groups. Uh, this is my lunch group and I can make a new lunch and say, uh, new lunch, and somebody got a search term. What does somebody want to eat? Indian. Indian. I heard Indian first. I don't know how many, well, there are probably that many Indian restaurants. Hopefully so. So, now we've got, uh, except I think it lost my login because I messed something up, but that's all right. So I can log in again, go to lunches, Go to new lunch and see that, hey, there are already people saying they like Delhi Palace. Awesome. Anyway, so that's the app. Let's actually look and see how this thing is built. Um, so the first thing, and I'll drag over my, uh, well, maybe I'll just, let's see. What's the easiest way to do it? I'll go ahead and drag this over. All right. All right, so I am going to start with the client side of this app. So this is actually two different apps, uh, believe it or not. The app that you're seeing is the Ember app, lunchdetective.herokuapp.com. There's actually a separate server, lunchdetectiveserver.herokuapp.com, and that is using something called Cores. Are people familiar with Cores at all? Okay, so half and half. So CORE stands for cross-origin resource sharing. So it used to be uh, JavaScript has this thing called the same origin policy, which would prevent you from making AJAX requests to domains that you weren't served by normally. The cross-origin resource sharing spec basically allows you to step outside the same origin policy in a controlled way. And it basically lets your server app say, hey, it's cool for JavaScript that, that I didn't serve to go ahead and call me. Um, so a lot of APIs support this um, out of the box now. GitHub does for sure. I know there are more and more that do. But basically, it allows me to have my server backend API live on a separate host than my client side app, which is kind of convenient uh, because I didn't have to worry about having a deployment process that is Ember aware and Phoenix aware. I can just let them be separate and things are okay. So I'm going to start with looking at the client side of this app. And I think we're having lunch arrive, so I won't talk super long. But um, let's look at some code. So this is Ember. And we're actually going to just start with the HTML of Ember. Uh, Ember uses a template language called Handlebars. And uh, in the Handlebars, um, Ember, uh, the route, which is maintains you know, which URL I'm going to, um, the Ember route uh, is going to expose a model, which is basically just the data that this page can get to. 
And in this case, because I'm looking at the handlebars template for the lunch route, lunch.hps, the model is lunch. Uh, so the lunch object has a few different things going on. Uh, the most important things is it has a recommendation and a URL. So that's like the title and the picture of the restaurant that is the current recommendation. Uh, and then we've got some buttons to vote. We can take an action of create vote true, which says yes, create vote false, which says nope. Uh, it displays the logged in user, and then it's looping over the current votes. So uh, Ember uh, is doing two-way binding so that any time the model changes, it will update the screen automatically. Just like, you know, there are a lot of, most any good JavaScript MVC framework is gonna do that kind of thing nowadays. Um, so, that's what the, um, that's what the template looks like. I'm gonna show you the router to show you just briefly what that looks like to actually um, get that data. Oops. So this is the route side of um, the same thing. And this is really interacting with Ember data. So as you can see, it's, it's pretty simple. I have a store, which is just my persistent data store. And I find a record of type lunch with the current lunch ID. So all the details of going out to the server and grabbing the JSON and serializing and deserializing, all that stuff is taken care of for me, which is pretty nice. So that's grabbing the lunch from the database. So the other thing, though, is like how, do, how, do, how does this stuff all fit together? Let's look at the lunch model just briefly. That's what he looks like. There are the properties, and Ember data also lets us model relationships. And this is how we actually have our votes. So uh, that votes is a relationship from lunch to votes. The other um, thing that I kind of wanted to show, this is kind of not where I meant to do this. So I'm sorry, I've modified this code slightly from what I actually have checked in. In the actual server code, that's what it actually is. And I'm just showing you that this is how I'm telling Ember data, here's how to find your data. So it's going to an entirely separate server to actually uh, fetch its data. Um, oh, that's the thing that I wanted to show you. So uh, Ember Data works with a concept called adapters. And what I'm doing here is I have a specific adapter for my lunch data source. And this is where I'm actually starting to make the, the bridge over to Phoenix specifically. And I'm using something called Phoenix channels to be able to do this. And what this is saying is, I want to connect to the lunch channel and listen for updates. And when I do that, I give it a handler to, to say, hey, on any, new, on any lunch updates, grab the lunch data. And this is actually the, the key piece of this. I'm saying anytime Phoenix sends me lunch data, I just want to push it into the Ember data store. And because Ember data is maintaining an identity cache for me, if lunch number four changes up on the Phoenix side and it sends it down to me again, and it's displaying that on the page, it'll know that, hey, that object is lunch ID four, it's already listening, and it'll just update itself correctly. And that's how I can send my new lunch down and everybody in real time can see the recommendations and the votes coming in. And it really is just like that little code on the Ember side to be able to do that. So this is what I really kind of like about, even though they're not like a, a cohesive framework together, uh, using Ember and using Phoenix together feels pretty natural and feels like a good fit to me. 
So I think that's all I have to say on the Ember side, and I'm running low on time. So I'll, I'll just show you a little bit of Elixir code kind of quick, and then we'll eat, I promise. Because all this talking about lunch makes people hungry. Makes me hungry. So this is what the server side of this app looks like. And I've got some wonkiness <laughs> issues here with uh, my screen width, but that's OK. Oh my gosh, what is going on? There we go. Is that font size OK? I forgot to ask earlier. Everybody seeing all right? OK, cool. So um, I'm just starting with the Yelp API itself. And if you guys want to just jot down those API keys real quick, that's totally fine. No, I'm kidding. I don't really care if anybody pretends to be me to access Yelp, to be honest with you. Um, but I have a little module here to actually search for Yelp. Um, but what I actually think I want to show you first is um, the controllers. So Phoenix is a typical, in a lot of ways, MVC framework. It's just not uh, object-oriented. It's really more functional. Um, but the layout of things is going to be pretty familiar. Um, and so if I look at a controller, I have a, um, if you've built RESTful backends, you're going to see pretty familiar stuff going on in terms of create, update, delete, that kind of thing. Um, the difference here is instead of being inside of an object where I have to pull everything out by accessing state on my object, I'm getting things passed into me. So I'm getting an object that represents the connection passed into me, and then I'm getting the params passed in as well. Uh, one of the awesome features of the uh, Elixir language is pattern matching, and this is an example of it. Uh, I think somebody mentioned destructuring, which is pretty much the same thing. Am I was that fair? Anyway, it lets me, as things are passed in, take things apart and assign variables. Uh, pattern matching also, and we'll see this in a second, lets me get rid of a lot of conditional logic, which is kind of awesome. Um, but this is kind of the meat of getting a new lunch set up. So I'm creating a lunch here at the very beginning. And this is where I'm actually calling out to get the lunch recommendation. I'm calling lunch recommend lunch, passing in the Yelp recommender. And this will take care of recommending lunch. I think the other thing that I want to show kind of briefly, because that's maybe even more interesting, is like, what do those votes actually do and how does that work? So when I hit yes or hit nope, What's happening is that's creating a new vote, and it ends up in the vote controller in this create method. And this is where the actual kind of meat of the action is happening. Uh, I'm grabbing my vote. I'm not going to have time to talk about Ecto too much, but it's, it's going to feel familiar if you're coming from like an active record ORM kind of background, but it, it really is is different in that it's, it's more functional and lets you actually create change sets rather than like, you don't have an object that you're setting properties of. You actually create a change set as a discrete thing that you end up then persisting when you tell it to by talking to the repo. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail there, but I just wanted to call that out briefly. Um, the, the key bit that's going on here is with this lunch.vote on. That's what basically takes your uh, vote and decides what to do with it. Um, and deciding what to do with it is over in the lunch module. And that lunch module, and this is an example of getting rid of conditionals with padding mat pattern matching. You see I have two different definitions for vote on, and those two different definitions uh, pattern match on whether the vote is a thumbs up, yeah, true vote, or a nope, thumbs down, false vote. And it, or in most languages, you'd see some conditional here. And uh, in Elixir, I can do this with pattern matching, which I kind of dig. Uh, and I'm basically saying if it's an upvote, I'm basically not doing anything much at all. I'm just basically 
grabbing the lunch out of the database with its votes. Um, if it is a false vote, that's where I actually call out to the recommend lunch logic. Uh, and I'm not going to go try to go through all of this in detail, but what it's actually going to do is end up making another call into Yelp to get another recommendation and advance the index in the, the, uh, the Yelp results. Going back to the vote controller, the last key bit of this is this is the, um, this is the server side of channels. This is where I'm broadcasting to that lunch updates channel that I showed you on the Ember side. And I'm basically just broadcasting uh, the result of rendering the view with the same exact view object that I would use if I was just making a RESTful request to the server. So I'm completely reusing all the view logic here to render out a lunch. Um, and so when I get a new lunch, it'll have its new recommendation and its new votes and Ember with bindings just knows, okay, uh, I know I'm listening to this object and I'll just display the right stuff. So that's kind of how it all fits together. And uh, I think that's, I'm over time already. And uh, if there's any questions, jump in. Or if you're starving, we can just eat. Chris, yeah. Identified, you had a channel on your Ember app listening for, for the back end. Yes. Why was it listening for channel? Is that a Ember convention or did you find that somewhere? Uh, channel is, um, that's kind of the abstraction that Phoenix gives me. Um, so there's a Phoenix JavaScript library that I'm hooking into Ember, and that's what gives me those, that channel abstraction to, to listen to stuff. Yeah. And that's over WebSockets? Yes, that is over WebSockets. Um, there, it's technically, you know, you could actually implement it over other protocols, but I don't think anybody's done so. Oh, did you have a? Oh yeah, you're, that's a good point. It's using uh, what, SockJS or is that? So yeah, SockJS, good point. If you're, for some reason, you use a browser that doesn't support WebSockets, it will fall back to long polling. That, thanks for pointing that out. Anybody? Oh. Yeah. So uh, one thing is that it is actually a functional language. That's a really significant difference. The other thing is, um, and I'm actually kind of glad you said this, because I did kind of want to point out um, if I actually break it down, any Phoenix app is actually an OTP app on the OTP platform under the covers. So like all the underpinning I talked about with OTP, supporting multiple processes, um, distributing um, management, supervision, all that good stuff is right there for me under the covers. It's not very far away and I can get to it if I need to. So that's, I think, a really key thing. Yeah, when Kevin gives his talk after lunch, maybe he'll point out a feature that we leveraged just by being an OTP app that, that meant like we didn't need a separate bit of architecture to do background processing like you would have to in a typical Rails app, which sounds a little silly, but it, it's, it's kind of true. <laughs> All right, well, thanks everybody. Let's actually have lunch. <laughs>